Good afternoon. Welcome to the Family First Prevention Services Act webinar. I am Deb Van Dyke Reese, Director of the Nebraska Court Improvement Project. With me is Jamie Kramer, DHHS Service Delivery Administrator with the Division of Children and Family Services. Before we get started, I want to remind you to mute your phone uh, because we are getting a little bit of feedback. Uh, you can use star six or just the mute on your phone. Please use the chat box um, on the screen for questions. We have tried to incorporate questions uh, identified prior to the webinar, but we will leave five to 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for additional questions. There are documents in the pod up at the top right for you to download. We will reference the documents during the presentation. Finally, we are recording the webinar, and it will be posted to the CIP YouTube channel in the next week. During today's webinar, Jamie and I will provide an overview of Family First. Those elements include a focus on prevention, placing children with families or foster family, defining candidates for foster care, identifying services, discussing the guidelines, the process um, for the QRTP or the Qualified Residential Treatment Program. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Family First Prevention Services Act was enacted February 9, 2018. This landmark child welfare law has the potential to establish significant changes in how the child welfare system is funded and operates across the country. Listed in the pod that I had mentioned earlier are various documents from ACF. One is the Information Memorandum on Family First. One is the Program Instruction for the Prevention Program Requirements. And the third document is the Title IV-E Program Instructions, all for your information. The new prevention federal funds increase current state funds. The focus is on prevention of foster care placement. And this is significant because nationally, only 15% of federal funds previously were used for prevention. 50% nationally was used for foster care. States had the option to implement Family First Prevention Services Act, October 1, 2019, or delay implementation. Nebraska chose to move forward October 1, 2019. One of the expectations is that the state develop a prevention plan. Also located in the pod is Nebraska's Family First Prevention Plan. Please note that this is a draft as the state is waiting for final approval from the Children's Bureau. There are four goals that we are going to be uh, looking at for Family First. And those four goals are prevention of removal of a child from the home, from their home into foster care. The focus is increasing services available to families and caregivers of candidates for foster care, which we will define later in the presentation. There is an emphasis on identifying and implementing quality evidence-based services that are trauma-informed. The third goal is to reduce congregate care placements. And the fourth goal is that if a child is placed into foster care, there is an emphasis on family-based placement. Now I will turn it over to Jamie. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As you can see, there are three different levels within the continuum of prevention within FFPSA. The first one is primary prevention. And what Nebraska will do to address primary prevention is to utilize a kinship navigator system. This is to assist kinship navigator caregivers in learning about finding and using programs and services to meet the needs of the children they are raising and their own needs. This is prior to the family coming to the attention of CFS. 
DHHS is currently working on purchasing a kinship navigator model, and this will be used by the Nebraska Children's Home Society and Lutheran Family Services to pilot within Lancaster, Dodge, and Madison counties. The final goal with this plan is that it will be implemented by about this time next year statewide. The second level is secondary prevention, or simply to prevent foster care placement, which we will go into more detail over the next several slides. The third level is your tertiary prevention, to prevent generational child welfare involvement. This is used to extend the program to youth who were in foster care at age 14 up to age 23 instead of 21 for the state of Nebraska. Youth may still be eligible for this if they aged out prior to, or if they aged out before age 18. What we found from Nebraska data in putting our plans together is that the majority of children enter our foster care system due to neglect. Parental substance abuse is a contributing factor for approximately 50% or more of children who enter out-of-home care. The age or the child abuse at the time of removal at, within 2017 for children between ages 0 and 5 who entered foster care, 47% of them were age 1 or younger. As of July 2018, 40% of all children involved in an ongoing services case had a parent who was also involved with CFS as a child themselves. Beyond the reduction of children in out-of-home care, CFS has recognized this data and has increased the use of relative and kinship resource homes by 12% since 2014 and has reduced congregate care settings by 3%. What came out of this was an additional analysis that was conducted by our foster care review office regarding the re-entry of youth after adoption and or guardianship dissolution. As of December 31st of 2018, 4.3% of the child welfare population were previous, that were previously placed in permanent homes through adoption and guardianship uh, found that they, these homes were no longer a permanent option for them. When we began planning for FFPSA, we held a kickoff, family first kickoff event in June of 2018. From here, we formed eight work groups to lead the planning and implementation for the correlating family first provisions, which you can find within our website listed below. And then we conducted a statewide service array scan to identify services that we could implement to help better serve our families. The purpose of the kickoff was to educate stakeholders on all of the provisions within FFPSA and to share the big picture vision of how DHHS, CFS, plan to implement the various provisions. The administrator lead for each of these provisions explained the purpose and indicated if the department was opting into the provision and specified if this provision would have a work group to lead the group. As I stated earlier, eight work groups were formed, and more information can be found on our link. The biggest provision within this was the prevention services and program plan. We dove into this, drafting the prevention services and program plan immediately. The first step was to review various data points to describe the children, youth, and families, and to understand what impacts removal, and is there or what could have prevented the removal, and then this led to that comprehensive statewide array, service array scan. This another provision that we know is the Kinship Navigator Program that I had discussed earlier as part of our primary prevention services. What we have found is that having these work groups and having the website created has helped the department to provide transparent communication and keep people engaged about FFPSA. As noted, the largest provision was the Title IV-E Prevention Program Plan. To be able to draw down federal funds for services, the services must be evidence-based and trauma-informed. Data statewide and nationally found that the three consistent areas of need identified by um, the government for services and child welfare are for substance abuse prevention and treatment, mental health services, and in-home parent skill-based programs. For our 4E prevention program 
to be in place, part of the criteria is to identify who is eligible to be a candidate for imminent risk of foster care entry. Each state, according to FFPSA, is tasked with establishing their own definition of candidacy. A youth may be eligible for services under FFPSA if they are at risk of their adoption or guardianship dissolving and or if a youth is in foster care, if a youth in foster care, excuse me, is pregnant or is parenting. Nebraska has proposed their own definition of candidacy and it is found in our draft submitted five-year plan, which you can locate in the pod above. I do want to emphasize that the prevention plan can encompass both court-involved and non-court cases. If it is a court-involved case, the child must not be placed in a formal foster care setting. Within our draft prevention plan, we have outlined six services that are evidence-based programs currently provided in the state of Nebraska through several providers. We currently have the Healthy Families of America Child Welfare Adaptation, Family-Centered Treatment, Trauma-Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, Functional Family Therapy, Parent-Child Interaction Therapy, and Multisystematic Therapy. How we came to identify these services and providers is that we utilized our request for qualification or RFQ process to help identify the services and providers in our state. During the initial RFQ round held earlier this spring and summer, 19 providers responded, with 15 of them being offered contracts to provide these services. Through additional discovery, we have also decided that new staff or additional administrative expenses are not anticipated as FFPSA will be implemented or has been implemented with the current staffing levels we have. However, we are currently working with Maine Spring Consulting to provide a thorough and comprehensive fiscal analysis regarding the cost effectiveness and the cost benefit ratio for each of the services we have identified thus far. I do want to note that this list provided in this slide is going to expand and there will be a continuous ongoing list of services. At this time, the federal government has a prevention clearing or a federal prevention clearinghouse where they provide a list of their current rated services and also a list of the pending services that they will rate in hopefully the very near future. This list can be found at preventionservices.ab site.com. Earlier we had discussed primary prevention. I do want to state that prior to the start of FFPSA, primary prevention was already occurring in our state. For the past 18 years, the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation, otherwise known as Nebraska Children, has been designated as a lead agency to receive funds through the community-based Child Abuse Prevention Grant Program. CFS has formed a strong partnership with Nebraska Children to support child abuse prevention efforts statewide. In partnership with First Lady Suzanne Shore, Nebraska Children, the Nebraska Child Abuse Prevention Fund Board, the Sherwood Foundation, and Casey Family Programs, DHHS is working with a diverse group of stakeholders to develop a statewide community-based prevention plan. Called Bring Up Nebraska, the initiative promotes local community partnerships that support child and family well-being. The foundation for Bring Up Nebraska already exists in several counties listed above through Community Response. Community Response is a voluntary system that is available to all families in a community, connecting them with resources and support to help them meet their goals and strengthen their relationships within their community. Community response is designed to reduce unnecessary involvement of a higher end system such as child welfare or juvenile justice, while also increasing the informal and community support in place for children, youth, and families. A fully developed community response system serves a range of citizens from birth to death through the braiding of resources. For the purpose of Nebraska Children Community Response, the public funding, including family preservation, specifically targets supporting families who may otherwise enter the higher level of child welfare services 
or experience significant challenges in areas such as adequate housing, early childhood development, educational goals, meeting of basic needs, or in meeting a family crisis. The ch these children are usually between the ages of 0 and 14. However, when a community breaks resources and involves multi-sector partners in a community response system, the focus can be on the lifespan. The goal of community response is to coordinate existing resources with the community to help children, youth, and families, either by matching them with a resource to solve an immediate need or through developing a longer-term relationship. That longer-term relationship is meant to increase family and community protective factors, strengthen parent and child resiliency, increase self-sufficiency, and realize positive life outcomes over time. The family-driven goals can include meeting basic needs like housing, utilities, food, and transportation, developing parenting skills, navigating challenging behaviors, and seeking further education on parenting topics. Building life skills such as job searching, budgeting, and management and money management, and strengthening family support systems and building community connections so all families feel they have partners who provide a safe zone to ask for help. A community response team is contacted when families with multiple crises cannot be resolved by one or two services or organizations, and if left unresolved, would likely result in higher end system involve involvement, homelessness, and or out of home placement. This team helps families who are willing to work to resolve crises and access assistance to strengthen their family and remain intact. Now we're going to speak about the mod other modifications related to placement with an FFPSA. There are placement limitations in place through FFPSA, limitations on Title IV-E foster care placements, payments for placements, excuse me, that are not foster family homes. This went into effect October 1st for all states, and the Title IV-E foster care payments are limited to two weeks unless it is an approved placement. What's identified as an approved placement that are not family homes are family-based residential substance abuse treatment facilities, a setting specializing in providing prenatal, postpartum, or parenting supports for youth, supervised independent living for youth over the age of 18, specialized placements for survivors of sex trafficking, and finally, a qualified residential treatment program also known as QRTP. At this time, Nebraska does have a family-based residential substance abuse treatment facilities, along with supervised independent living for youth over age 18, along with QRTP. The supervised independent living for youth over age 18 at this time can be found in Lincoln through the Cedars Bridges program and also through Omaha Home for Boys. For placement with a parent inside of a treatment facility, Title IV-E foster care maintenance payments for children with parents in a licensed res must be for in a licensed residential family-based treatment facility for substance use. This is optional for states and Nebraska has opted in. What this does is that it allows foster care payments for up to 12 months for an eligible child placed with a parent in a licensed residential family-based substance abuse treatment facility, and this facility must provide parenting skills training, parent education, and individual and family counseling under a trauma-informed framework. There are, like I said, three identified treatment facilities that are working with DHHS to accept foster care payments and also meet the above the listed criteria in this slide. They are currently St. Monica's in Lincoln, the Bridge in Hastings, and Heartland Family in Omaha. Another placement option is the QRTP. There are five separate components for a qualified residential treatment program. 
The treatment program must have a trauma-informed treatment model designed to address the needs of children with emotional or behavioral disorders and be able to implement the treatment identified by the assessment completed. There is also an aftercare component that is not required to be face-to-face, -face, but Nebraska at this time is working with our QRTP provider and any future providers to ensure that aftercare services will be face-to-face. -face. The QRTP must have registered or licensed nursing staff and clinical staff available or accessible 24-7, and that it is imperative that also that the family be engaged in this entire process in helping the decision-making model process as it relates to the child's treatment plan. The QRTP must also be accredited. The QRTP is not a new level of care. It is still congregate care, but with added components to help identify the best level of placement for the youth through the use of an assessment by a qualified individual. At this time, Nebraska has identified one QRTP through OMI and it will be located at their therapeutic group home in Seward. Nebraska is presently having conversations with at least four interested organizations regarding QRTP at this time. Now I'm going to talk about the QRTP and the 30-day assessment that is a requirement for the QRTP and the 60-day court review. So there are requirements around the QRTP, QRTP placement which includes a 30-day assessment, which can be 30 days prior to the placement or 30 days after the actual placement. And the next slide will discuss the assessment further. Also, within 30 days of the placement at the QRTP, the court must approve or disapprove the placement and document it in the case plan. So to dig a little bit deeper into the 30-day assessment, the assessment must assess the strengths and needs using an age-appropriate, evidence-based, validated functional assessment tool. In Nebraska, a qualified individual currently from Region 5 services will be conducting the assessment using the CAFIS, the Child and Adolescent Functioning Scale. They will do a face-to-face -face assessment uh, within a 250-mile radius. If distance is a barrier, they can do it over the phone or via a telehealth system. This assessment will determine whether the needs of the child can be met with family members or through placement in a foster family home. If not, the assessor will determine if the QRTP or another placement will provide the appropriate level of care for the child in the least restrictive environment. Child-specific short and long-term mental and behavioral health goals will be identified within the assessment. The assessor, which cannot be an employee of the state, will work with the child's family and permanency team while, conduct, while conducting the 30-day assessment. The permanency team assembled by DHHS must consist of appropriate biological family members, relatives, kin, professionals, and if the child is 14 or older, the team must include members selected by the child. The assessment must specify in writing the reasons why the child's needs cannot be met by the family or in a foster home. Shortage of foster family homes is not an acceptable reason for this placement. If the assessor recommends a QRTP, it must be stated why it is the most effective and appropriate level of care in the least restrictive environment. Within 60 days of the QRT pl QRTP placement, a court must first consider the required 30-day assessment of appropriateness for the QRTP, determine whether the, child, whether the needs of the child can be met through placement in a foster family home, or if not, whether placement in a QRTP provides the most effective and appropriate level of care in the least restrictive environment. 
Determine if the placement is consistent with short and long-term goals for the child. Approve or disapprove the placement, and such approval must be documented in the case plan. And it, it must be noted that a QRTP does not qualify as a permanency option. If the court does not approve the QRTP placement, or the assessment determines that the QRTP placement is not appropriate, the agency has 30 days to transition the child out of a QRTP. If the child remains in the QRTP past the 30-day transition period, no federal funds can be used to cover those placement costs. Following a QRTP placement approval, the agency must submit at each review and each permanency hearing ongoing assessment that the QRTP meets the specific treatment needs of the child, that this placement is the least restrictive setting, that it's consistent with the short and long-term goals for the child as specified in the permanency plan. It must document that the agency must document that they have provided efforts to prepare the child to return home or to be placed with a relative, guardian, or foster family. CIP has developed and distributed sample court orders for judges to use at review and permanency hearings specifically related to the QRTP requirements. The Court Improvement Project has been required to provide education to child welfare legal professionals as part of our funding requirements. Um, how we have been doing that is by providing presentations at Through the Eyes of the Child team, team meetings at the Nebraska Children's Summit that was in September in Kearney, at the Fall Judges Meeting at, at, and at the County Attorney's Meeting. We have taken a broader approach to providing education to all court stakeholders not just the specified legal professionals. And so that ends our formal presentation. Um, and at this time, we would like to open it up for any questions that anybody may have. You can use the chat box to enter your questions. Or if you would like to um, just send your question over the phone, we can also answer questions in that way. So if we do not have any questions, um, I do want to reiterate that we have recorded this webinar. Um, the webinar will be posted on the uh, Nebraska Court Improvement Project uh, YouTube channel. And um, if anybody would like um, copies of the presentation or um, additional copies of the documents that were listed in the pod, please uh, reach out to the Court Improvement Project. Also, if you have, um, if you would like additional information um, on the next slide, you will see that um, listed is the Department of Health and Human Services Family First website um, that will provide additional information there. And if there are no questions, thank you for your time. And um, everybody, enjoy the weekend. Thank you.